Today I'd like to talk to you about what I believe is a critical need uh, that's not being addressed in our classrooms, and that's the need to fundamentally and critically explore the role of technology and the role that technology plays in our lives. So let's begin with looking at Google Glass. Just last week, Google announced that Google Glass will be available to everybody next year. And I think this raises fundamental questions about anonymity and privacy. You can imagine, if, if not today, certainly very soon in the future, where Google uh, Glass could interface with uh, Google's face recognition software and image recognition software. Uh, would we be able to zoom into conversations from long distances? Uh, could we interface that conversation uh, that we zoom in with, uh, with lip reading software? So what mechanism exists to fundamentally ask uh, these questions about uh, is, is Google Glass a valuable uh, product? Uh, how will it change our sensory perception and, and our cognitive function? Uh, you could ask the question, will it enhance those things or could it replace them uh, altogether? So we have fundamental questions that we must ask. And for that, we may look at a guy by the name of Ray Kurzweil, famous uh, futurist and author and inventor, and his uh, development of the law of accelerating returns. And what he says is that technological growth is exponential. One invention does not lead to two inventions, which does not lead to, to, to four inventions. One invention leads to five, which leads to 30, which leads to 100. And along the lines, uh, the next 100 years of, of technological growth and change will be not 100 years of progress, but more along the lines of 20,000 years of human progress. Now, let's say Mr. Uh, Kurzweil is 100% is, is wrong, and it's only 10,000 years of, of scientific progress. Uh, does that mean that we also have 10,000 years of social change? Uh, economic change, political change, and where is the mechanism in our schools to fundamentally question these changes and, and what these changes can, can bring. Let's take a quick look at 3D printing, what's being called the second industrial revolution. Uh, what does it mean when I can take my neighbor's shoes that I like and throw them in a 3D printer that I can currently buy for less than $2,000 and I can replicate those shoes? What effect does that have on copyright and, and patent law in the United States? There's a website called defcad.org and defcad.org, you can literally download dozens of plans for guns, and since December, defcad.org has downloaded, has had 250,000 uh, downloads. They currently have 3,000 uh, new hits every single hour. So we have people in, our, in, in the halls of Congress debating gun control. Gun control could be a mute issue um, simply because of 3D printing. We're currently being told that the first person to live to 150 years old is alive today. And the premier scientist who's working in anti-aging and immortality says with near certainty that the first person to live to 1,000 will be born in the next two decades. Now this raises incredible questions and, and you can obviously see uh, what this might do to population uh, growth on, on, on the planet. Can we sustain longer uh, lives and greater numbers of people? What does retirement mean when you're living to 150 or 200 years old? What about family life? Uh, if I live to 150, does my 120-year-old son come to me and ask me for fatherly advice? Science, there's been a major push across all levels for STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'm not denigrating that, and I'm not saying that there's nothing intrinsically uh, wrong about a STEM push. We need scientifically literate students. But the way that has traditionally happened in the schools is we've given them more time. We're giving them more quantity and not necessarily better quality. And that's an issue. Science should be about doing. But we don't do that in our classroom. So what we say is, uh, let's give them more time to learn science and, and technology and engineering and math. And when you do that without unlimited time, you marginalize the other aspects of, of school that make, that make school enriching. And that's what this is really all about, is value. And the science uh, classrooms uh, that we currently have they're not interested necessarily in value. They're interested in fact. What do we know and what do we don't know? Technology is interested in what can we do and what can we not do? And, and, and to get to a different set of questions, the critical inquiry into technology, you have to rely on social studies. Just because you can do something does not mean that you should do something. And just because you can't do something does not mean that you should try. There are critical questions that we must ask of technology, critical questions of ethics, morality, society, 
political questions, and these are best served in a social studies classroom. For the last three years, uh, my students have engaged in a digital downtime project. Phase one requires those students to uh, record and describe the nature of all of their communication uh, and all the time that they spend online, all their text messaging, all their uh, talking, all their video gaming, and they get a really nice picture of how much time they actually spend with these technologies. And I can't tell you how many times I hear the, I, the, 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 this come up. Shandell, you know, I, I got on uh, Facebook last night and I only wanted to get on there for five minutes. And I looked up and it was 45 minutes later. And I say, yeah, that, that happens. I said, no, that happened to me yesterday three different times. So these kids, they, they understand uh, that, that they uh, need to take a look at their use of technology uh, and the role that technology plays in their lives. And there's literally too many things to talk about in class, so they go home and they talk about these at the dinner table. And I often get parents who email me and some parents will say, you know what, this is a great project and our whole house is going to do it. Uh, we're, we're all going to uh, look at the usage of our technology and analyze it. And then you get to phase two of the project. And phase two of the project requires the students to unplug. There is no cell phone texting. There is no cell phone talking. There's no social networking. There's no video gaming. Uh, and, and they really have to live uh, as best they can without technology. And then you go to the final part of the project. And this is where students can organize themselves, self-organization into groups or individually. And they create authentic assessment opportunities. And they can apply what they've learned in all of our discussions and in all of their notes to some kind of overall goal. One of those things could be uh, joining an organization. They could uh, partner with civic or, and, and local and political uh, organizations and people to develop strategies to uh, take a look at the use of technology uh, and, and, and technological policies. Uh, creative students, poets. Uh, I, I've seen some great poetry written about the use of technology and the impact that it has on ourselves or on our society. This is bigger than a test. It's more powerful than a test. To take a test you would reduce what we've done in this unit and homogenize it as a simple fact-finding endeavor. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking to regurgitate facts. We're looking to find value in life. And the only way to do that is through a passionate commitment and engagement of the questions that make life beautiful and meaningful and valuable. Thank you.